In this video, I'd like to show you how to solve some basic quantitative and symbolic energy problems using the tools that we've developed through lab experiences and conversation in class so far. The tools we have at our disposal are qual a qualitative tool called an energy bar graph where we can figure out where energy is stored before an event happens and after an event happens, and we can come up with what we call the energy conservation equation. And we've also developed equations that allow us to calculate the amount of energy stored in the kinetic energy account, the gravitational potential energy account, the spring potential energy account, and the amount of energy transferred into or out of a system, which causes the system to change energy. And re remember, that's defined as work. So let's look back at one situation we've talked already about qualitatively. If you're interested in reviewing basic energy bar graphs to figure out how to get an energy conservation equation, you can check out two linked videos in the description below. This is prerequisite knowledge I'm assuming that you have coming into watching this video. If not, go check out those two videos before you progress forward in this one. Okay, I'm going to go back to a situation we've already talked about when we talked about conceptual or qualitative energy bar graphs. It was essentially like a roller coaster kind of thing where we had a car against a compressed spring at initial time. At a later time, it's up higher at a vertical loop. And let's first go through and review how do we do the basic energy bar graph and let's use that to solve a quantitative and a symbolic problem related to this scenario, which is going to be the basic process you go through with any quantitative or any symbolic energy problem. So at position A, where's the system store energy? And we're defining our system, the thing or things that can store energy as the car, the spring, and the earth. Well, the car's not moving at position A, so there's no kinetic energy, or there's no energy stored in the kinetic energy account. It's at a vertical position of zero, so we'd say the car and the earth together have no energy stored in the gravitational potential energy account. But there is a compressed spring, and so we'd say there's some energy stored in the spring potential energy account. Once the car gets to position B, uh, it's moving, so it's going to have some kinetic energy. It's up higher above a height of zero, and so there's going to be some energy stored in the gravitational potential energy account. The spring, we're going to assume, is no longer compressed anymore, and so there's no more energy stored in the spring potential energy account. We're going to assume, just to make it a little bit simpler, that there's not significant friction. So there's no energy stored in the thermal energy account. If we started with five bars of energy in the spring potential energy account, that has to be split up between the kinetic energy account and the gravitational potential energy account. Right now, we don't know which one has more, so let's just put three bars in the kinetic energy account and two bars in the gravitational potential energy account. Once we set this up, we can make our energy conservation equation. We can say that the spring potential energy stored at position A, it's all stored in the spring potential energy account. Once we have this basic energy conservation equation, we can solve some quantitative or symbolic problems about this. So let me go back and give us some numbers we didn't have before. Let's say the spring had a spring constant of 1,000 newtons per meter, that it was compressed 5 meters from its relaxed length, that the car has a mass of about 200 kilograms, and let's say at position B it's 3 meters higher than the ground here, where we defined a height of zero. And one question might be, is when it gets to that position, how fast is the car going when it's 3 meters above the ground, given all the other information we have? Well, we can just use our energy conservation equation and the equations we have for each of those energy storage accounts to solve for the velocity. So let's just substitute in for each energy storage account the equation we use to calculate each. So for spring potential energy, remember that's one half times the spring constant times the amount of spring compression or spring stretch squared. And specifically, this has to be the amount of compression at position A in the beginning. That's going to be equal to 1 half mv squared. That's our equation for the amount of energy stored in the kinetic energy account. We're going to use the mass of the car, and it's got to be the car's velocity at position B. That's what we're trying to figure out. That'll be plus the amount of energy stored in the gravitational potential energy account, and that's calculated by the mass of the object above a height of zero times the Earth's gravitational field strength times the height it is above zero. So that's the vertical position at position B. Now we can use this energy conservation equation in a slightly expanded form to either solve for the velocity quantitatively in meters per second or come up with an expression which represents symbolically the size of the velocity. So here's our equation, and if we want to figure it out quantitatively, let's just plug our values in and see what we get. 
So we're going to plug in a spring constant of 1,000 newtons per meter, a spring compression of 5 meters at position A. The car has a mass of 200 kilograms. We don't know what the velocity is at position B. That's our unknown we're going to solve for. The mass, again, is 200 kilograms of the car. We'll use an, the Earth's gravitational field strength of 10 newtons per kilogram. And it's remember, it's 3 meters higher than a height of 0. So let's plug in a vertical position at B of 3 meters. Let's simplify. 1 half times 1,000 times 5 squared is 12,500. And remember, anytime we're solving for a quantity of energy, as long as we're plugging in the correct units, we're going to get units of joules for our units of measure. That's equal to 1 half times the mass times the square of the velocity at position B plus the amount of gravitational potential energy stored by the car on the Earth. So that's 200 times 10 newtons per kilogram times 3 meters gives us 6,000, and the units work out to be joules. So let's do a little bit of algebra. We're going to subtract 6,000 joules from each side, so we're going to get 6,500 joules on the left side, and subtracts it from the right side, and 1 half times 200 is just 100 kilograms, so we get that 6,500 joules is equal to 100 kilograms times the square of the unknown velocity. If we divide each side by 100 kilograms, we're going to get something equal to velocity squared, so we're going to have to square root each side. When we do those two steps of algebra, we get that the velocity at position B is about 8.07 meters per second, which is about 18 miles an hour. Okay, let's now solve that same problem symbolically, where we come up with an expression which represents the velocity at position B, but instead of having quantitative values for the spring constant, the amount of compression, the mass, and the height at position B, let's just leave those as symbols and solve this the same exact way. Our energy conservation equation doesn't change. It still looks like this. The amount of spring potential energy is equal to the sum of the kinetic energy and the gravitational potential energy stored by the system at position B. So let's just use this, and without plugging numbers in, and solve algebraically for the velocity at position B. So let's first start by multiplying each side of the equation by 2, just to get rid of those one-halves in each of those expressions. So we get kx squared is equal to mv squared plus 2 times the mass times the gravitational field strength times the vertical position at b. For the next step, I'm just going to divide each side by the mass. So on the left side, we get kx squared divided by m. The mass cancels out of in this expression and this expression, so we get v squared plus 2g times yb. We're going to be solving for the square of the velocity, so let's subtract 2 times the gravitational field strength times the vertical position at b. So we're going to subtract this from both sides of the equation. So we end up getting that the square of the velocity is equal to kx squared divided by m, and we're going to subtract from that 2 times the gravitational field strength times the vertical position at b. Since we want an expression for the velocity, at b, not the square of the velocity, let's take the square root of each side. And so the final symbolic expression, which is equivalent to the velocity of the car at position b, is equal to the square root of all of this. So it's the square root of kx squared divided by m minus 2g times the vertical position at b. Now that we have this symbolic expression for the velocity, we could also answer some proportional reasoning questions about if we change something about the system or the setup how would it would affect the resulting velocity. So let's just do that for one simple example. So, and we're gonna actually make it a little bit simpler. Let's think about a situation if the vertical position at B was zero. So it, it wouldn't be when the car was up at a height above zero, it would be when the car is moving after it's been launched by the spring. So this term goes away because we plug in zero for the vertical position at B, then this whole term goes away. And so that just turns into that the velocity is equal to the square root of kx squared divided by the mass. So let's answer this question. How would the speed change if the spring was compressed two times farther and the mass was three times bigger? Well, notice the amount of spring compression is in the numerator, so if we're increasing the amount of compression, that should make the velocity go up. But we're increasing the mass, which is in the denominator, so that should make the velocity go down. Well, Overall, with both changes, is the velocity increasing or decreasing, and if so, by how much? Remember, with proportional reasoning questions, you can take any general equation like this 
and just imagine that there's a coefficient of one in front of each of those variables, right? If we do that, that doesn't change this. And so when we're trying to figure out if we were to change, you know, one or multiple of the variables and how it would affect the answer, let's just change the coefficient in front of each variable based on what's changing in the question that's, that's asked. And so we're gonna make uh, this two and we're gonna make this number three. So plugging in those coefficients, we get that there's a two in the numerator, but we have to square that two because it's along with the amount of spring compression, which is squared in the equation. We're gonna plug in the three in the denominator. So in the numerator, we have two squared or four times one is four still. And in the denominator, it's three. So we have four over three, but those coefficients are under a square root sign. And so if we pull those out, separate those from the symbols, we get that the coefficient is gonna be the square root of four thirds. So if the amount of spring compression is doubled and the mass is tripled, this is gonna be greater than one. So the velocity is gonna go up specifically by this amount. So that would be the answer for this proportional reasoning question. In this video, we looked at three different ways to talk about one specific scenario, but any energy problem you come across, you're gonna go through the same process. You're gonna make an energy bar graph, you're gonna come up with an energy conservation equation, and then use that to either solve something quantitatively, come up with a symbolic expression, or do some proportional reasoning. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked what you saw, consider giving it a thumbs up.